All right, I think we are online now. So hello, everyone. Thank you for joining to uh, the second session of the esteemed workshop. Um, so today um, we have um, uh, Georg Mursik from D3TN who will be chairing the session. So thank you, Georg, for offering your, your help here. Um, so today we have at the beginning uh, a, a very interesting keynote from David Evans from ESA, who will be sharing some details about the OPSAT uh, from the European Space Agency. And then we have a series of four expert talks uh, by Carlo, by Olivier, by Gunes, and by Sandra uh, that will be given. Uh, some of them are in a pre-recorded video and we have Q&A live with them here. Uh, and then I, let me briefly mention that also in the afternoon, we have another session with some extra expert talks as well and two papers presented, uh, also the YC track. So these are going to be paper presentations that will happen in the afternoon. Um, again, I recall you that we are, uh, you have the agenda published on the website and every session are using, we are going to be using the same Zoom link uh, all the time. And uh, we are recording the session. So uh, if by any chance you drop or you need to drop earlier or whatever, you will find the material uh, as well offline to follow it on your side. So without further ado, I will stop sharing my screen over here and I will pass the token to Georg uh, so that we can start the session of today. Georg, the, the floor is yours. Thank you, Juan, for the kind introduction. Hello, everyone. It's my pleasure to share this session. As Juan showed, we have lots of exciting present presentations today. So uh, many, in fact, that the time is a little bit tight. Um, therefore, it would be great if you could post um, questions already during and after each presentation in the chat. We will see how many um, questions we can address online. And if there are any un unanswered questions, um, please send them to the speakers in a DTN fashion. All right. Um, <laughs> um, we are very happy to have Isa's David Evans here today for the keynote uh, presentation. David has a very long history with the European Space Operations Center um, in short ESOC, and he already uh, also worked um, many years at UTELSAT. And um, at ESA, he is now the manager of ESA's dedicated OPSSAT Space Lab. And um, we are very excited to learn about how the in flight implementation of onboard communication protocols uh, improve the OPS SAT um, operations. So please welcome David, um, the stage is yours. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Gregor. Okay, so we haven't got much time, so I'll just dive straight in. Uh, let me see if this is gonna work. Yeah, okay. So uh, yeah, as Gregor said, I'm the manager of OPSAT Space Lab. So what is it? Uh, so basically this is an ESA service. It's a free ESA service for, for European uh, uh, businesses or, or academia or startups, etc. And basically, we provide access to a, a family. We, we hope to create a family of, uh, of po powerful, uh, open, reconfigurable laboratories in, in orbit. This is the thing to basically. And each one of these missions has a unique theme. So, for instance, one we've just started called OPSAT Vault is optical and quantum communications but they all share a few common characteristics. One is that the, uh, we allow third party uh, experimenters to basically load their own software and firmware. Uh, we don't test it very much uh, and they can interact with it directly either in real time or offline. And so this means this has implications for the design. It has to be designed correctly because you know, the experiments will go wrong or, and, and, uh, and the spacecraft on the ground better be prepared for that. Uh, and the, the idea is to be able to recover it, but not necessarily to damage it. Uh, and they all contain something in the centrally, central to the system is a powerful CPU, uh, CPU with a reconfigurable FPGA, which we'll come up to later. And we also require a very high uplink speed compared to normal spacecraft, uh, because we are basically changing the software and firmware on a, on a, on a daily basis. Okay, so at presently we have OPSAT 1 in orbit. Uh, OPSAT Vault is just about to start. OPSAT uh, 2 will start uh, next year. Okay, and then maybe we have OPSAT 3 and OPSAT 4 and whatever. We, we, we will see how, how things play out. So this, this is about OPSAT 1 and our experience of uh, updating uh, communication protocols in space. So this is to give you just a brief thing. We launched 2019. Uh, 
to the ground, OPSAT looks like an advanced thesis spacecraft. So for instance, it has a four times higher uplink rate, it flies communication protocols we've never flown before, some new ESA patents, et cetera. And at the middle of it, we have this, op this processor, it's a, an Altera system, a module. And on this, you can run normal software, you know, Linux, Java, Python, uh, we see. And, and from, from this, this pro profile, you can do anything to the spacecraft. You can rotate it, you can take pictures, you can communicate with the ground, you can basically do everything you want. You know, that, that uh, so it's, it's really like two spacecraft in one. And we hand one to the experimenters. Yeah, and uh, yeah, we, people, European industry and institutions, they use this to test their software, 3DTN or, or an example of that that have used it to, to great effect. So this is the space segments, just quickly over this. It's basically two spacecraft. That's one of the spacecraft, the green area and the purple area. Uh, which is based on CubeSat technology. The green area is, uh, it has everything that a normal CubeSat would have. Uh, off the bus, based by on GOM space. And uh, the, the purple bit is what makes it look like a normal spacecraft to the ground uh, because it's CCS, uh, CCSDS compliant uh, S-band transponder, which can do uh, 256 uh, kilobits up and one megabit down. On top of that, for the experimenters themselves, we have lots of other things. We have a and on the top, we have a hardware, uh, a high definition camera, we have an optical receiver, uh, we have an X band transmitter, we have uh, uh, you know, various things there that are all written down. I don't have time to go through it, but this is the really interesting bit the, the red, but because this is the, uh, the Cyclone 5 system on chip with this uh, uh, you know, ARM uh, core, uh, uh, ARM processor inside dual core, etc. Look at a little bit more of that, you see there, we have this, we call it the SEP, just because that comes up later. It's running embedded Linux. Uh, we operate it like a Linux machine with a remote shell. We have uh, package managers that we install things and remove things, etc. Uh, and we on it, we, we run, you know, Java, Python, this is the sort of thing. And on top of that, we also provide uh, frameworks on which experimenters can uh, make it a little bit more easier for them to, interact with the spacecraft. So for instance, we have this thing called the NMF, the Nano, uh, NanoSat MO framework, which means they don't have to go down to the driver level or the API level even of uh, how to turn the spacecraft. They can just write something which is like, you know, it says like turn spacecraft by 90 degrees, you know, and then it, then uh, the rest will be dealt with. Sort of like a, an app type uh, system. So here's where it gets uh, a little bit more uh, uh, complicated. Uh, but this is perhaps the, where you, you guys are more interested. So we have the, the, the spacecraft, the, the GOM space spacecraft, if you like, the, the, the policeman spacecraft, that's the green area. And you can see here, it's got, uh, it's got various, everything you can imagine, magnet talkers, software, housekeeping, uh, GPS, sun sensors, all, all, all the normal stuff. We have dual redundancy. And you can see there, there's a few protocols there that we're using, like UART, uh, CAN is available. Uh, and uh, yeah, this this is this is like uh, the, the green bit. And when we get to the payload, we start increasing the number of buses. So we have, for instance, uh, two separate I squared C buses, uh, one for uh, controlling the bus switches, so turning on and off the units and the data lines for every single unit. That's a safety feature. Uh, another one for controlling, interacting with those units which only provide S squared I squared C. But on top of that, we have CAN, which is used for, that'll come up a, a lot later. SPI, USB, uh, LVDS, uh, various various bits. And you see here, this is the set. This is the, the main processor sitting in the middle. And from here, you, you can communicate with all the different things. Like for instance, here's a software defined radio. That's a fine HCS with a star tracker, reaction wheels, et cetera, on it. Uh, here's the S-band link. And if you, I need, it's so complicated, I need two slides. So this is the bottom bit, so this is the SEP again. And you can see here we have the uh, reaction board and optical receiver, et cetera. So from, from here, this is where the, the experimental software goes. And you can see it's extremely well connected with every sort of uh, protocol that's needed to all these different units on board. And this also, this bit here, this CCSD engine also plays a, a role in what we're gonna talk about. Uh, because what that basically is, is a, a TM encoder and a TC decoder. Uh, and it's why we call it the CCI, it's spelled wrong, huh? CCSDS uh, 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 engine, we call it the engine because it's based on the protocols that we normally use in space for telecommanding TC. 
So it has a role where it basically, uh, we take the IP calls from ESA, in fact, uh, we put them onto an FPGA, a ProASIC FPGA, and then we access quite a lot of the, uh, the normal functions for dealing uh, right away through from, uh, from uh, the, the top level uh, all the way down to, to packets, you know, through the frames and the segments and, and uh, fragmentation and everything. Okay, so this is the this is the basic setup, and okay, now what happened? So first of all, when we launched, uh, we we had communication problems. This is the, the first thing to to understand. The we have different ways into the spacecraft. One of them is via S band, uh, and one of them is by UHF. First thing that happened is the UHF communications were absolutely awful. Uh, if you look over, this is a diagram that somebody made of the. Uh, of the background noise, and you see here, basically over Eastern Europe, it's uh, it's really bad. Uh, towards the Atlantic, uh, it gets cleaner again, the environment. But basically, over here, you know, with the with the border of uh, of Russia, for instance, it's uh, it's getting really bad. Uh, there's lots of radars working in that area, and uh, they are also uh, using the, the the same sort of frequency. So we didn't expect this. And what it meant was that basically we were getting sometimes one or two packets in orbit. Uh, sorry, a pass, which is which is not enough to control the spacecraft effectively. Second thing that happened is we have S band. S band is protected, uh, and so when we turned on the the, the receiver, uh, everything was fine. We could send telecommands, but when we turned on the transmitter at the same time, we saw a dramatic increase in noise. So 10 dB, so 10 times increase in the in the noise level. So there was a, an interaction of, of feeding of noise into the into the receiver, and of course this makes life very very difficult in order to try and uh, and command the spacecraft. And finally, our ground station we had two high power amplifiers that failed after a couple of weeks, uh, and because this is a cheap mission, it was and it was in the middle of COVID, uh, the uh, it took ten months to repair. So the the result was this. So basically, we were left with a spacecraft where we could only uh, get about two minutes commanding a day. Uh, and uh, and it was completely unpredictable of when they might occur. Yeah, so that this was the, the result of the thing. The spacecraft was in very bad shape, uh, but the, the communications preventing us from doing much. So the first thing that, that I, I want to say is we had to update the onboard software immediately. Yeah, there was, there was problems in the onboard software. We had to update it. How do we update it? Under such conditions, you know, two minutes—it's uh, just—it's not enough to, to update that. So what we actually did was we started to use the SEP. So uh, well, this was the first thing. So, so it's a, a guy that was working for me came up with the idea, and we basically load a compressed file to the SEP whenever we got commanding, which contained all the space packets necessary to do the onboard software load, and then we spoof the nano mind into thinking that the SEP is, is the ground. Yeah, uh, and then we send them slowly outside ground coverage. So what used to be an hour, the first time we did the onboard software uh, update, it took one week. And in the end, we could do it between two passes. So in 90 minutes. How do you get telemetry also under such conditions? Well, we did the same thing, we, but in reverse. We basically send TM to the CCSDS engine as if we'd send it to the ground, but the transmitter's off. So it's not going to the ground. But we load to, on the SEP application on to the uh, which will sniff the CAN bus. And set snap bus, it would collect all the traffic, filter for the TM patrons, put that in the file and compress it. And then whenever the, uh, the, the link came up, we could send the compressed file down, back down again. And hey presto, we actually got a 10 fold increase in telemetry volume in terms of an actual real uh, throughput compared to even our ideal nominal case. So it's an example of how we got the, the initial challenges sorted out. But of course, this is not changing any of the communication protocols. It's just misusing the communication protocols. Uh, what, what did we do? Uh, well, the first thing uh, to understand about the problems we had or like the solutions we had really is to understand the CAN bus. So we chose, this is the CAN bus. I highlighted it in green so it's obvious. And you can see that the CAN is connecting the, the CCSDS engine you know, so it's coming from the transponder through the CCSCS engine to the nanomines. These are the, the main control processors and also the SEP. And what happens, we, we decided that the nanomine came with a particular protocol 
CAN protocol. I mean, just, just saying CAN isn't enough. You've got to have a protocol on top, of course. And uh, there was already one available. This uh, is called the CFP uh, protocol. And so we uh, perhaps naively decided to implement that everywhere, including the SEP, uh, and the ground, and, and uh, in, the, in the CCS, the SNG. Uh, and it was fine for nano mind communications because the nano mind was limited by the application. So because it had to, it has to process TCs and has to put telemetry down. So all that was uh, was basically going very slow. Uh, what we, but what the impact of, of making this choice was that the CCSDS to SEP connection here was actually resulting in, uh, in speeds of onboard speeds of basically 150 kilobits per second, whereas actually the the theoretical limit it could support with CAN was one megabit per second. So this was uh, this was a uh, uh, well, uh, I could say not ideal. Uh, and the other thing that we wanted to do, we wanted to implement TCP/IP over the over the space packets. Uh, except what we found is such a link uh, operating that the MTU sizes were too small, uh, the overheads would be too much. So it's theoretically possible, but completely not a good idea. So we needed a backup plan. So. Well, there's another connection. Yeah, so the, the, there's a connection here between the CCSDS engine and the SEP, and this is based on LVDS. So we said, so before we launch, we said, okay, let's let's uh, implement a system where we can connect the CCSDS engine and the SEP with uh, something which would be better than 150 kilobits per second. Uh, and uh, we came up with something, so we decided to implement SpaceWire. SpaceWire Lite, in fact, is the, is the version we implemented. But there was no time to test it. So this, this was the problem. So what we had to do is we had to implement it. Now the CCSDS engine is a pro-ASIC and it's fused. Yeah, so we can't update it in orbit. So this was the, the bit to get right first. Uh, so we, the manufacturer implemented SpaceWire light on it, did some local testing uh, and then fused it. On the, on the, set, on the, the system side, so the, we did some loopback testing uh, which worked up to the handshake level, but no data. We didn't have time to actually test it with data going between the two links. And then we went and launched the spacecraft. Now, in orbit, we managed then to upload the uh, spacewire light to the Ceph FPGA, but it didn't work. Initially, it didn't work. And analysis showed that the CCSCS engine was not sending the last byte of the space packet. So just an error in the data in the data layer which would have completely screwed everything up. So we would have had absolutely no way of, uh, of using that wire, but we were lucky in that this part of the space packet, we implemented the CRC 16 field on it, and it was not really needed. So you could do the CRC check uh, with, with the first byte, uh, which was done. And then we altered the driver so that we did a check using the first byte. And if that was okay, then an adding byte was made. Yeah, to, to basically, again, spoof the, the rest of the system into thinking it was a full space packet. And actually, this worked. This worked. And we actually, by this one, one update, we managed to increase the effective data rate of the mission by six. So now that's not enough. Yeah, because, uh, you know, once okay, you, you say that, but you've got to run the other layers on it. And the next thing, once we had space wire up, we could, uh, we had NTUs which were large enough to allow IP over CCSDS space packets, which what we what we wanted to do, and this was uh, something that I just want to say because uh, once we all implemented IP, the world completely changed for OPSEC. Yeah, this is the point. So uh, because the SEPs run in Linux, suddenly many native Linux services, which I'd never heard of until now suddenly became available like on the command line. Yeah, uh, rsync, SSH, uh, remote kernel messages, daemons, HTTP, it, it was just uh, everything. I mean, and I, I, I include BusyBox because this is my favorite piece of thing ever. You can usually find whatever you want to do in BusyBox. You know? uh, and this allowed the mission control team, uh, I include industry in this, but to, to increase the productivity of, of the mission, of the whole mission, I would say by an order of magnitude. So we really, really like, it was a massive increase. And functions that would previously have been written by us, then tested, then loaded the spacecraft, et cetera, they became one-liners, which we could do basically in real time. Yeah, just, uh, we, we had episodes where basically we were trying to do stuff, with, look on the internet, find the, 
find the right command, send it in real time to the spacecraft and hey presto, it worked. So the experiments also benefited from this, I call it the Cambrian explosion, you know, where we just had this, this just because we got this uh, communication protocol change, uh, which resulted in IP, which resulted in access to, to Linux uh, underlying things, like an amazing uh, jump. Also, uh, but it didn't always work. So sometimes the space wire interface didn't work and still does not work sometimes. And we have to fall back to CAN, which is like going back to the dark ages. But one of the other things I'd like to say is this, this ability to have this reconfigurable FPGA also allowed us to do wonderful things in terms of troubleshooting. So this is actually, a, a, we loaded up a logic analyzer to the spacecraft to find out what was going on. And this is coming directly from the spacecraft. You see, these are the different lines, the, 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 the clock line and the data line, et cetera. Uh, and you can actually see what's going on. We, we can change the, uh, you can sweep the, the frequencies by adding delays. You can invert the lines, et cetera. And you can monitor the statistics on what's going on. So basically the visibility into the communication protocol online is also absolutely unprecedented. I think on, I've never seen this ability to do this on a traditional spacecraft uh, at all. Uh, another solution that we are still working on as well, as well as this, because we're, uh, is to take what we call the bypass. So here's the, the transmitter receiver, and basically you can select if you want to go through the logic of the, of the, the CCSDS engine doing all the different, you know, frame level, segment level, etc., or just send it directly on, send on the bitstream on directly to the set. And so one idea is, and we're working on this at the moment, and hopefully we might be even finished by Christmas, is that uh, we can simply route the, uh, the, the bitstream to the SEP. And on the SEP uh, FPGA, we implement all that data layer processing, uh, basically meaning that whatever's wrong in, in the CCSDS engine, we basically bypass it. So this is another, another uh, idea that we might be able to do. Okay, where are we? Uh, space lab status, we have yeah, lots of companies, lots of countries, 231 experimenters at the time, experiments. We have JPL, JAXA, CNES, DLR, EU Commission uh, are also there. Uh, many startups research, lots of new space and lots of, uh, of education as well. Uh, there's just some examples of things that we've done. Yeah, D3TN is there, uh, as an example there in the middle. Uh, but lots of other stuff of, of, uh, is there. And our fastest submission to results time, so that means the time that somebody submitted a, an idea to actually getting the results uh, was, including all the testing and everything, was 72 hours. Okay, conclusions. Well, what, for me, as a, I, I'm not a communications guy, I'm a system engineer, I'm a project manager. And what this experience shows me is that the, the onboard choice of the onboard communication protocol can have a significant effect on mission productivity. And this isn't understood, I think, sometimes. It, I think it's far more than data rates need to be considered. And this is what I would, uh, I would say to anybody who listens to me uh, anymore uh, from now on. Uh, and also that just taking a, a communication protocol that's available is not always a good idea. So because the the, the context of how that communication protocol has been used uh, can sometimes mask other things. Like for instance, it worked perfectly well on the nanomine because the nanomine was the, the bottleneck, et cetera. Uh, but then it, it wouldn't work uh, on, when that bottleneck was removed, then we hit another constraint which is actually in the communication protocol itself. And uh, we hadn't realized that, or at least I hadn't realized that as project manager until we actually, you know, it was too late. The other thing is having the ability to update the FPGA in orbit is a completely new world of operational possibilities, yeah? including changing the onboard uh, communication protocol and being able to troubleshoot it when it failed, etc. This is a whole new ball game in terms of what, what we can do. And uh, yeah, this is something that's come up. And launching with a partially tested communication protocol was risky. Yeah, it was extremely risky. And I have to, I have to acknowledge that we were lucky. So, uh, and uh, I would not recommend doing it in the ideal world, but, uh, but yeah, we got away with it this time, but it's still interesting. But on the other hand, and I have to say this, that all the problems we experience, the difficult problems we have now, they all center on the, on the CCSDS engine, FPGA. And why? Because it's fused. 
because it's the one part of the system we can't change and we don't have visibility into. So for me, if it had been possible to update and troubleshoot the CTSCS engine in orbit, then maybe that the, the point above becomes a little bit mute. Yeah, so it's about like, I think you can launch things which are partially tested uh, as long as uh, you, can, you can troubleshoot and update all the different elements that are connected to it, yeah? And finally, I'd like to thank uh, Max Henkel of TU Graz. He performed the majority of this work. It would have been completely impossible without him. He was uh, on the team that built the spacecraft and has been providing support ever since. And thank you very much. Thank you so much, David, for this exciting presentation. Um, we already have some questions in the chat, so let's just very quickly go through them. We have, I think, two minutes time. So first of all, um, is the nano satellite running some um, real-time operation system? You mentioned embedded Linux before. Uh, yes, the, the nano mines are. Oh, I can't remember. I can't remember exactly which one it is. Uh, I'd have to find that out. I can send it to you afterwards what the exact operating system is. All right. Um, another question. Um, how do you deal with radiation? Um, the hardware looks um, pretty off the shelf. Also um, asked by Joaquin Amoyo. Yeah. Yeah. Very, very interesting thing. So if you'd asked me uh, like six months ago, I would have said we almost see no impact of radiation. Uh, however, since then, something's happened. So we've had uh, file corruption. On the uh, on the memory, so the the whole Linux is uh, completely the, uh, went crazy, and the whole thing was lost. It took us a while. It took us three months to recover it, uh, and the we don't know exactly what what it is, but it looks to be some sort of wearing out of the of the NAND flash, uh, being exposed in orbit to to the radiation environment. So we've completely changed our our approach. So we don't write to flash. We avoid writing to flash as much as possible now. We keep everything in RAM as much as we can. Uh, and this seems to work. We haven't had file corruption since we've changed all this thing. Uh, but yeah, that's a radiation effect, I'm sure of it, because it also, uh, yeah, it's an aging effect, which isn't helped by radiation, put it that way. All right, thanks. Uh, last quick question from Juan. Did you find that the latency imposed by the conversions from or to the link to CCSDS engine and SpaceWire affected the out of the box Linux applications you mentioned? Uh, no, not the not the uh, not the applications. Uh, but what I would say is that we're running uh, we're running things that are not ideal. Yeah, so uh, the uh, I can say we're running at speed. SpaceWire shouldn't be run at the speeds we run it. It should be lower. Also, the the SpaceWire that we chose, SpaceWire Lite, we chose it for cost reasons. It's free. Uh, and uh, it's not something that's supported by by ESA, et cetera. Uh, so I would say this is this is one of the things. The other thing is TCP, uh, of course, also uh, works well when the link works well. Uh, when it doesn't, it works very badly. So you have, yeah. you know, that there is definite impacts of uh, the fact that it's a spacecraft over an unreliable link, which has a lot of latency that have to be taken into account. Yes. Thank you very much, David. Um, we still have some questions, but unfortunately we have to move on um, to keep with the schedule. And um, I'm very happy um, for our first expert talk in this session from Carlo Caini. Um, he's with the Department of Electrical, Electronic and Information Engineering um, in the University of Bologna as an associate professor. And um, today he's going to talk about bundle protocol, unified API, and interoperability tests. Um, yes, um, please go ahead, Carlo, and um, we are happy to have you here today. I think. Okay, you thank you. Yes, I, I, I had the microphone uh, switched off. So I'm going to share the screen. Can you see my slides? Uh, not yet on my side. No. So uh, let me try again. I can try this way instead of the screen. Now, better? 
it, it seems that it, you're starting, but we are not receiving yet the shared screen. So it's kind of in the middle right now. Yeah, it's also still uh, blank for me. Okay, so I can't tell you why. <laughs> uh, do you have do you have two screens? Maybe it's uh, no, no, sharing... no. I, I am just just uh, just one. Uh, so I can't uh, uh, I can't send the, the slides of the maybe on the chat. So I, I hear uh, Zoom uh, tells me that uh, I'm sharing the screen, but I cannot uh, see the the green uh, the green uh, uh, frame. So I think that uh, there is a problem with uh, with uh, with uh, with uh, Zoom. Maybe I can try to disable the, the camera. Anything has changed? No. Okay, sorry. I will try again. Yeah. No. Okay. So there is. A, <laughs> it is basically impossible to share uh, the screen now. So let me see if I can at least uh, uh, send my slide right. on uh, on the chat. Um, yeah. Please. One one thought, uh, Carlo, is the the um, window that you need to that you want to share has to be, it can't be minimized at the time you ask to share it. When you click on the share button. Um, uh, must be many, okay, your, okay. One of the windows that is, um, that you are already, um, that is already full size. Okay, so I can try again. Let me see if uh, it works, no? Oh, now we see now something. Now we see something. We can see something now. Great. Thank you, thank you, Scott. <laughs> Even so it's a little bit uh, small. <laughs> uh, now, if you can put a presentation mode, the icon on the lower right hand side, that can yeah. improve. What about now? I'm sorry, I can see my presentation full screen now, but oh, yeah. I don't know what you can see. Uh, uh, we, we see um, a very small resolution of PowerPoint. Okay, uh, so let me let me just uh, I, I try to send on on the chat, and maybe ask uh, uh, Juan to to share uh, uh, the screen. So let's do that. Yeah. Do so this. here, if I want to to add something. Yes, then uh, Jesus is very. Um, so um, as an alternative, um, Carlo, we could maybe uh, move to Olivier. Yes, first. this is, and, yes, um, yes. So that I, I have the time the to, to share the screen. Thank you, thank you very much. Yeah, yeah. Yes, this so, is the um, best thing for sure. <laughs> uh, Olivier, um, um, are you ready to present? Yeah, yeah. Perfect. Um, so Olivier, I, I, I will try. I will try. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Uh, Olivier, maybe, I, awesome. maybe I will have the same problem. So I'm, I'm <laughs> trying to share and see if everything's okay. Uh, okay. okay. Ah. So I'm um, Olivier Alphonse, an associate professor at the Grenoble Alp University, and um, um, we are happy that he will present us things at Laura Gateway CubeSat. Please go ahead. <laughs> Yes. Uh, is it for sound? Yes. Do you hear me? Yeah. Perfectly. Yes. I just okay. had some dropouts, but it's okay now. Thanks. Okay. So, uh, thank you for uh, for the invitation. So, uh, the uh, the idea is to give you some first feedbacks about uh, one idea of a bunch of professors that want to do uh, IoT experiments but uh, not on the ground like they always do before, but uh, in space. So we are not, we were not experts of, uh, of space. We are not, uh, but uh, we, we, we take this adventure. So uh, that's uh, the, the first feedbacks of, uh, of this thing, of doing an IoT uh, gateway and sending in, in orbit. So, 
Uh, yeah, the outline is not, uh, you have the outline afterwards. So uh, basically, the, uh, this could not have been possible without the new space uh, revolution. So I think that everybody knows uh, what it means. But uh, our gateway is in a, is hosted in a CubeSat. So definitely, we benefit from this revolution, which is uh, the fact that we have component of the shelf. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's also, uh, for us, it was mainly cost reduction because it's not our CubeSat. We were all still uh, payload and we benefit also from the launch vehicle uh, sharing. So we will talk a little bit about that uh, afterwards. So the idea is that uh, in Grenoble, uh, there is an academic space center. There are several academic space center in different towns uh, in France. And um, the CESUG uh, is, uh, the, the mission of the CESUG is to federate, in fact, the actors from research, industry, and education by involving them in the construction of uh, nano satellites. So they have already several payloads and one CubeSat, I think, mm, that, was, uh, that were in orbit. So it's about Earth observation, space weather, uh, now, the, I think what is planned is greenhouse cases monitoring, and we come with the idea of doing uh, IoT communication. So we came to them with this idea and they helped them to, to make it real. So a typical team from such as an academic space center uh, is we, you have on one side uh, us, the non-expert uh, space expert with an idea. So Didier is the one that has, uh, was, is the project investigator and uh, who really believes in that uh, at the beginning. And then uh, myself, Olivier, uh, so Didier is a computer science professor. I am a computer network uh, professor. We are uh, working in the Laboratoire Informatique de Grenoble. And uh, there, there, uh, there, there is a third guy, with this, which is Stan, which is uh, the telecommunication uh, professor, so the antenna expert, and Emric, which is the research engineer that is working with us. So um, to explain, so the CubeSat experts are the one from the CESUG, which uh, with its director, uh, Thierry, which helps us also for the or to, to, come to, to see how our payload uh, could uh, be uh, included in the, in the CubeSat. And Iman was also a, a project manager that was taken for several projects uh, among those uh, things set. And to, it was really helpful to follow the project. And we have uh, an army of students over the four past years. So a small army, 20, 20 students to, um, to, um, from different Grenoble engineering school that help us design and uh, come to the, the, the lower board that we, we, we will show afterwards. So uh, the idea is uh, just a brief slide about LoRa. So uh, we benefit from the IoT also revolution on Earth. And LoRa is, uh, is, the long is one of this technology, which is, uh, which is uh, really cool because it's not uh, no license. It's on the ISM band. So it's, Typical thing is it's a long range, so um, the range is typically in line of sight, ten kilometers, and it's low power. So it's the power of your um, telecom for your to open your car, but it's possible to send it to ten kilometers. That's what we're saying. So it's mass produced by Semtech, so we have cheap hardware, and there are already a lot of uh, networks that are uh, widespread on the uh, on the earth, commercial networks and private networks. So before uh, having that, we, we did in fact uh, a lot of um, experiments on the ground, and uh, before the CubeSat, we did preliminary experiments with weather balloon plus um, nodes, lower nodes that were inside us. So we, ha we have this in the southwest of France, in Toulouse. Uh, we send the balloon and we were able to receive some packets on the refuge de, du, Goutte, du Goutte, on, um, on the Mont Blanc at, at Chamonix. So it was nearly uh, 600, it was 600 kilometers from, uh, so it's near Grenoble, Chamonix. It's, it's more known than, uh, than Grenoble. Man. Uh, but the, the balloon was, was at uh, 20 kilometer uh, altitude. And we, we, we do not have optimized antenna. We use the antennas from the devices that were on the shelf. So um, we, um, uh, 
so think set what it is it's uh it's uh, one fourth for you uh, hosted payload so we have a lora we design a lora electronic board uh, a dual antenna band uh, antenna also because we work on we want to do experiments on two frequencies on uh, 868 megahertz and 2.4 gigahertz and it was in a polish in a polish it's in a free uh, free u polish cubesat which is named stork uh, one, uh, which is on a sun synchronous orbit and uh, 500 altitude kilometers also, and which is not a pointing. So we have ACDS, uh, and it's not true. Uh, we, we saw that it's not true for all the cubesats. So we bef benefit the mission. So is to characterize, in fact, lower link in space, and we have a different also uh, use case we want to 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 experiment. So one typical uh scenario is this one is that we want to have a low ride iot device uh on the ground being able to send lower packets to this cubesat this cubesat is going to carry those lower store them carry them and when the cubesat is above the destination uh for the experiment we want it to relay the packets toward the ground station or uh, iot devices also so the ground station are linked to a cloud where where they gather all the data um so this is a typical scenario we want to to and in this case we really have a, a, a gateway in the space okay uh, so here is the inside of the, the CubeSat. So here you have not our part, the onboard computer from the Polish guys. And here is our payload. Okay. So we, we, we have the connectivity with LoRa here, uh, but we need to, to, to use their OPC in order to flash the firmware and to send commands in order to drive our uh, payload. So, what was the idea at the beginning? We have on the shelf this thing, which is a gateway, a earth gateway, which was a very low, the best in terms of consumption at this time. So we have a Raspberry Pi here. And here we have this chip set on SX 1302, which was on the 868 megahertz band. So the problem with that, we cannot send that directly in space because uh, Raspberry Pi is not very low power. The port is not usable for space because of the connector, the gazing, team whiskers. And, but it has an advantage. It was, we have all the Linux uh, source code available. So now what we need to do was, so here is the board we got at the end. We need to uh, change the Raspberry Pi to uh, a microcontroller, okay, STM32. Uh, uh, we need also to do the design of the electronic port. We are not electronicians, but uh, did you believe in that? So <laughs> we were able to do that at the end uh, with, with our students also that were more experts. Uh, uh, so we, we here you have the, the radio ship you see just before which is here and which is being controlled if, in fact by this microcontroller, okay? And we have the same thing for 2.4 uh, gigahertz. Here you have the connectors for the different antennas and also a canvas and everything we need to be able to operate, uh, inter operate with uh, the Polish guys. So why did we use, we also use uh, an operating system. We do not, we want to be versatile. We do not want to have only a pillow that was able to, um, to turn on and send LoRa beacons like most of the LoRa CubeSat that were existing at this time. So um, we want to have something that was more versatile. So we need an, an operating system. And I already uh, on the Riot before, so that was the opportunity, okay? Because uh, STM32 uh, is well, um, behave well with the, uh, is supported by Riot. It's open source, it's small front, multi-threading. It's also supported, uh, there was a driver for the Canvas and there was an architecture of the network driver and there was firmware update over the space. So it was really a cool, um, it was definitely something completely relevant. And we know the guys from the INRIA also that was taking part to that. 
So we need to port uh, the driver for uh, this chip because we it was not existing uh, in the um, in the repository. Uh, th same thing for 2.4 gigahertz. There was several uh, protocols we need to port because uh, we need them to operate with the uh, onboard computer. We did a uh, scenario engine to be versatile in terms of missions. Uh, integrate TLO library also for backlisting sensible Earth IRA. And uh, we did an OBC emulator because it was not um, Sat Revolution, which is the, set, uh, the, the CubeSat company. Uh, did not give us uh, an OBC emulator to see, uh, to do our, our, to connect it to this stuff. So here on the left, you see what we have on the desk, uh, STM Thunder controller, so uh, Nucleo. Here with the, uh, the part without uh, the Raspberry Pi. So we need to find all this stuff uh, electronically. Here you have the engineering model to do the test on ground. And here is the, fi the flight model that was done uh, in Toulouse. Uh, okay, so uh, our board was uh, put here in the CubeSat, okay, just above the antenna, the dual band antenna here, uh, that uh, is a patch, definitely, we need, we, we have the constraint that we have 10 centimeters by 10 centimeters here, that was the only space we have, the thickness was um, lower than one centimeter, and we want to have circular polarization and dual band also. Can want to do something like that for, uh, for its research. And we use a, a space substrate roger. Um, okay, and that's the, the, the design of the car, the antenna we done with the students. So here what uh, was, uh, we send that to uh, Sat Revolution and they integrate it on the, the, the CubeSat and they send it to uh, to SpaceX. So this. Uh, so apart from the the, the board uh, and the antenna and all the stuff uh, to design this, there was also the fact that we need to talk about what is on the ground because here we have end uh, end devices that cannot use um, uh, normal antenna that uh, that are being used on the Earth. So the idea uh, was to to do the budget link to see a little bit. Uh, what we have as a margin, and also the, first, the fact that we have non-tracking antennas on the ground, and they need to be small because we have small, uh, small, um, small objects. So here we see that for maximum window visibility of a of few minutes, uh, it would be we would have uh, this ten margin uh, link margin for an elevation of uh, thirty degrees. So all this stuff. Um, we need to, to check it's if everything will be uh, okay in space, but it seems it seems possible. So we didn't did, we didn't do that, but we need to find an antenna that was uh, compliant with that. And uh, Fabrice Ferrero, which is working at uh, the Oricom at Sofia Antipolis, already did something during we were developing our card. We saw one of his conference at TTN uh, conference, and he already did something for Lacuna Space. Uh, with so it give up, it gives you basically the idea of uh, which kind of antenna uh, would be cool to be used on, on such uh, end device on the ground. So the diameter is uh, less than um, ten centimeters, and the height uh, more or less one centimeter. Okay, and we have good performance for that. It's the the pattern diagram uh, in the sky. You can see. Uh, the elevation and all this stuff. So we need to, to think about that also. So, and we need sorry to, think... to interrupt you, Oliver. Um, do you think you can uh, wrap up your presentation in one to two minutes um, so we uh, manage to... <laughs> yeah, it's basically, it's oh, basically okay. done, yeah. yeah. So, sorry. We, okay, we need to think also about the ground station. And we have a part also about updates because we have the missions for six or two months. But we need also updates uh, to update the mission and to do firmware updates, etc. So we need to use, as you can see here, the uh, VHF and UHF tubes operator communication to be able to do that. Okay, so I'm, I'm nearly 15. Okay, so the conclusion, the payload is now in orbit. It was sent with uh, SpaceX with 100 other spacecraft. 
uh, CubeSat. Uh, and the conclusion is that for now, it's still not commissioned. In fact, it was sent in January, but there were a solar storm in uh, February that touched also um, Starlink uh, satellite. So the, the conclusion is that we need to be very patient for such academic projects, and we are still uh, de uh, communicating with the Sat Revolution in order to be able to, uh, to get the communication with the satellite. It's a long time, but we are working on other projects. And for now, the contribution is Laura Board Design, Riot Code, the dual band antenna, and we expect to share all the data from the experiment and the knowledge and traps from such projects. So, oh, it's okay for me. So you have all the information on the, the Git repository, which is here. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much, Olivier, um, for this interesting presentation. And we wish you all, all the best um, for your success. Um, as the time is a little bit tight, I, I propose we jump back to Carlo. Uh, maybe, Carlo, if you can um, squash down um, or, um, the presentation a little bit. Um, so Yeah, like, I will um, try to be as uh, brief as possible. So the next slide, okay. please. Thank you. Thank so we can start you. from, yeah. The screen shared, uh, Carlo. So you just let me know and I can skip the slide for you. Yeah, you, next slide, introduction. Okay, so uh, we can start from a good news. So there is an increase in the interest in DTN communications, that's good. There is an increase in number of bundle protocol implementations. Maybe this is also good, but as a negative side effect, uh, the development of a third party application is uh, somewhat discouraged as each BP implementation has its own application programming interface. So uh, prospective programmers has the choice between uh, to focus on one implementation only or uh, to develop different versions of uh, the same application. And uh, both alternatives are not particularly appealing. So our solution is different. Next slide, please. And so our idea is uh, to build uh, an abstracted uh, uh, interface that we have called uh, unified uh, API uh, in order to offer prospective programmers uh, uh, a, a, a unique interface uh, compatible with uh, most uh, major bundle protocol implementations. At present, uh, uh, the unified API is compatible with uh, ION, both BPv6 and BPv7, DTN2, DTME, IBR, DTN, and uh, we have just added this uh, micro D3TN. And so the unified API is, stems from the experience that we gained with uh, its uh, predecessor that was called abstraction layer. So we can think of the unified API as uh, a new version of the abstraction layer, but we changed the name because the code was uh, 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 almost totally redesigned, and there are a lot of new features to facilitate the prospective programmers. And so, uh, uh, a note that is important to stress applications based on the unified API are intrinsically interoperable. Next slide, please. So, you can compile the unified API library and uh, the application based on this library, both for uh, one implementation. And so in this case, the choice is made at uh, compilation time, of course, or you, or you can compile for multiple implementation. Uh, the extreme case is that you can compile for uh, all the four implementations supported. In, the ca in this case, we have just one, one uh, uh, executable that at the runtime can uh, make the choice uh, regarding uh, the um, uh, API that must be, must be called. Next slide, please. Uh, the unified API is based on three layers, consists of three layers. The uh, top uh, layer uh, called uh, AL is the only layer that should be seen by the application. And then we have a, an intermediate uh, layer that works as an internal interface 
Then we have a third layer in pale colors that basically um, consists of uh, the functions that are used to um, convert uh, abstracted types into uh, specific API types and also to call the specific API type. Everything is uh, written in C uh, or in C++ for uh, about the protocol uh, for the um, uh, for the BPIBR uh, uh, because uh, IBR is uh, is in, in C++. Please next slide. So this is an example of uh, layering. If we, uh, we consider the uh, send instruction as the um, uh, Top layer, we have the whole socket send that is called by the application. The application must uh, uh, pass a socket descriptor, an equivalent of uh, uh, what you usually have with, with uh, UDP uh, sockets. And then uh, you have to pass uh, uh, the destination, the report to addresses, and a C structure containing all possible bundle options and the pointer to the bundle payload. This function called the OLBP send, which in turn will call, uh, for example, the BPDTN send if uh, the bundle protocol that is running on, uh, on the node is DTN2. And uh, this uh, BPDTN send uh, is in charge of uh, carry out the conversions that I have just uh, mentioned. And then it calls the DTN2 uh, uh, um, the DTN send that is uh, uh, specific of uh, the uh, DTN2 API. Next slide, please. Uh, the top layer consists of four blocks. The most important block is the socket block. Uh, basically, this is the core of the unified API as far as uh, the application uh, is concerned. So uh, this is very important for uh, the uh, application uh, program for application programmers. In this block, there are uh, function to initialize and stop the unified API. Then uh, uh, there are the function to register and unregister uh, the applications, and then to send and receive bundles, of course. Um, I think that is. I think it's important to stress is the fact that uh, the register function automatically copes with the alternative DTN and DPN and point identifier schemes. So basically, the programmer has to provide both uh, the DTN DMUX token and uh, the IPN service number. Then the choice between DTN and DPN and point identifier at the registration is made by the registration by the registration, uh, uh, by the whole socket register. And this is performed automatically on the basis of uh, the bundle protocol implementation that is running. If it's uh, ION, for example, IPN is chosen. If it's uh, DTN2, DTN is chosen. And but anyway, you can force the automatic uh, selection if you like, so that you can use, uh, for example, DTME, you can use uh, IPN, you can force IPN. Okay, uh, maybe we can, next slide, please. Uh, inside this uh, second block, there are the function that uh, help the programmer to manage the C structure containing uh, basically all the information related to the bundle. More interesting maybe is the fact that inside this uh, block, there is also a module to parse bundle protocol options. So the problem is that each bundle protocol implementation has its own peculiar subset of bundle options and extensions supported. And uh, this subset also depends on the bundle protocol version. So it is very difficult uh, to cope with all these uh, variety uh, of uh, possibilities. And so the solution we have uh, proposed is to delegate uh, the parsing of the bundle options and uh, the checking of compatibility of the selected bundle options with uh, the um, bundle protocol implementation that is actually running on, on the node uh, to the unified API. So this way, parsing and compatibility checking uh, become transparent to programmers. Next slide, please. So the TNS Suite is an umbrella project now including the unified API. And 
before it was the abstraction layer. And then there are a few DTN applications based on it. The most uh, famous maybe is DTM perf, but there are also DTM box, DTM fog, DTM proxy. And uh, we have a new one that is called DTN chat. The previous version of DTN suite are included in uh, the official ION package, thanks to the support of, uh, of Scott Barley. So thanks, uh, Scott, again. And uh, the updated version of DTN suite will be passed to ION uh, maintainers as soon as completed. Everything is released as a free software and can be downloaded uh, in the meantime from uh, GitLab. OK, so next slide. Uh, this is to show that uh, um, applications that are built on top of the, of the unified API are uh, really suitable to carry out interoperability tests. In this case, I have used uh, DTM perf, and uh, we can see on uh, uh, on the left uh, DTM perf client running on a micro D3TN node. So there is the yellow key just to highlight that the BP implementation found by DTM perf is micro D3TN. So the client in this experiment, very simple, just sends two bundles of 50 kilobyte each to the other node where ION is running. And so you can see that in this case, uh, that we, have, we have the DTM perf server running and uh, 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 there is a printing telling us that uh, the server found the ION implementation. And you can see that uh, there are uh, rows uh, denoting the arrival of both of the bundles. So I can, after this experiment, I can, uh, I have also repeated the experiment in the, in, uh, the opposite uh, direction. So the client on ION uh, and the server on uh, micro D3TN, it was successful. So I'm pleased to confirm that uh, uh, ION and uh, this was also with BPV7. The ION and uh, micro D3TN are compatible. Uh, the compatibility at application layer is not perfect because uh, there is uh, uh, maybe something to, 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 to fix uh, because uh, uh, DTM perf uh, can run in two modes. One is rate based and that's okay. The other is window based. In the window based mode, it is necessary to know the timestamp of the bundle sent. We can see here that the bundle's timestamp is reported as 0.0. .0. So that uh, is because it is not returned by uh, the micro D3TN uh, implementation. And this uh, basically prevents uh, uh, the use of uh, the window based mode. I think that this could be fixed. And maybe there is another problem, it could be another problem because we need uh, in DTM perf, we have two threads, one uh, uh, to receive the bundles, one uh, to send the bundles and both use concurrently the same registration. So it seems there is a problem if uh, uh, we want to send, if we send a bundle uh, on a registration when we have uh, uh, a receiver a receiving uh, instruction blocked waiting for, for a bundle. So this is concurrent uh, uh, use of the same registration is, uh, is possible in ION, but maybe not uh, in a micro D3TN. This is something that must be investigated. So it's just to tell you that the protocol is, uh, is okay. Uh, the uh, compatibility for uh, the application is uh, at, I would say at 80%. Next slide, please. So DTN chat is uh, the latest uh, application, is the first uh, uh, built on uh, the unified API for the first time. And so it was a test to see if uh, it was uh, uh, difficult or not for uh, my students actually to develop an application based on, uh, on, uh, on unified API. So we can see that we cannot, uh, we cannot, uh, we cannot, uh, uh, Make a phone call to Mars, as in uh, in uh, the picture. We cannot dial M for Mars uh, because of the delay, of course. 
but we can uh, chat with uh, Martians or astronauts on Mars. So this is why we have developed this, um, this application, is a graphical application. We can send uh, messages, text messages, audio messages, uh, selfies, and we can also include, uh, we can add uh, files. And uh, okay, so this is uh, based on uh, on unified API, so it is uh, uh, intrinsically interoperable. Uh, next uh, and the last slide. So basically, the unified API aims to decouple the bundle protocol application from the specific bundle protocol API. And so this is uh, advantageous under uh, several point of view, but especially is very suitable to interoperability tests. Among the most uh, prominent feature of the unified API, we have the fact that we, have, we offer the programmer a socket that is UDP-like, so relatively easy to use. There is automatic uh, registration uh, with DTN or uh, IPN. There is a, a, a module to parse uh, the options. And then, but uh, not for importance, we have now uh, the support to the micro D3TN. This is also thanks to the code that was uh, was uh, provided to us uh, by Keith Scott. Okay, so the hope is Thank that you. everything uh, can be useful. <laughs> Thank you so much for the presentation and the effort of you and your team to unify those different um, DTN implementations. This is really nice. Thank um, you. It's, uh, one mentioned due to the technical difficulties, um, I think we take uh, around five to 10 more uh, minutes as anticipated um, for the session. I hope um, for your understanding, everyone. And um, so to not lose any more time, um, Juan um, will now uh, uh, play the presentation of Gunnar Scott, who is an, as you have said, Professor um, of the Polytechnic Montreal, as well as an adjunct researcher, research professor at the Carleton University. Please go ahead, Juan. And, um, and she's available for questions. Um, um, yes. Hello, everybody. My name is Gunesh Karabulutkurt. I'm with the Department of Electrical Engineering in Polytechnic Montreal. And I would like to start my talk by thanking uh, Juan uh, for inviting me to this in interesting workshop and for organizing uh, um, uh, this workshop with uh, very interesting uh, talks. The title of my talk today is an overview of communications and networking in low Earth orbit mega constellations. I would like to first start with an overview of the mega constellations, uh, the perspective. Um, and uh, ambitious plans of uh, building these constellations. Then I'll talk about the standardization aspects. Later, I will try to um, elaborate some key aspects from the communications uh, perspective, uh, looking at the space to ground connectivity and inter-satellite communications perspective, uh, um, links. And then very briefly, I'll talk about networking in space. I'll try to provide a overview of the future research directions, and finally conclude my talk. <clears throat> uh, now I'd like to start with why we need um, uh, the uh, low Earth orbit mega constellations, although it is um, an actual industrial trend, uh, as we can see in the news every day. If we uh, go to the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, these are the uh, 17 goals uh, that uh, aim to uh, achieve ambitious uh, gains for people and the planet by 2030. Uh, global internet access uh, emerges as an essential enabler. So, for example, if you look at the quality education, uh, the um, internet access to all students and the um, uh, instructors and the professors and the teachers and the whole education team uh, is essential as we have seen uh, during the last few years. And um, so it's an es essential uh, component that needs to be there, essential but not sufficient. The idea of uh, connectivity uh, 
as uh, targeted by the United Nations is to leave no one behind. And uh, as defined in the Age of Digital Interdependence report, uh, access is a necessary but insufficient step forward. And to capture the power of digital technologies, we need to cooperate on broader ecosystems that enable digital technologies to be used in an inclusive manner. So the essential, uh, the necessary, uh, or uh, I should say it as a mathematical proof, the necessary but insufficient condition is to provide internet access. And how can we provide internet access in hosp inhospitable trains? I have to <clears throat> go back to this um, a slide to show uh, the map on the right side. As you can see, uh, there are uh, the, the map uh, shows the satellite dependent communities in Canada. And uh, there are a number of these communities that solely rely on uh, satellite-based internet access due to um, uh, the difficulty uh, to deploy terrestrial networks, including fiber networks. So it's important to have high data rate and it's important to have uh, interactive uh, connectivity for all these communities. And the solution, uh, um, uh, it uh, seems promising with the satellite networks and we are already aware of the fact that many countries have already launched a number of uh, satellite communication networks and uh, uh, these companies include Starlink, OneWeb, Kuiper, uh, Amazon's uh, Project Kuiper and Telesat and uh, uh, tens of thousands of, of satellites are planned to be deployed in these mega constellations. Now, uh, that takes me to the second part of my uh, uh, talk today. <clears throat> Why do we think it would it's it will be different this time? Because for some of uh, us, um, it's it's a story that we have uh, seen to evolve uh, with the Iridium and uh, a number of other uh, trials. And uh, satellite uh, connectivity was never a huge uh, business su um, success. But this time, it has the potential to be different. And this potential uh, it simply emerges from the integration of the terrestrial and satellite networks. So in, as the networks evolve, as the terrestrial networks evolve, they also encompass different components to uh, accommodate the uh, necessities of satellite networks. And it's not only satellite networks, the sixth generation is uh, envisioned as uh, a vertical network that's composed clearly of the satellite uh, terrestrial network first of all and then the aerial network that includes uh, uh, aerial vehicles like uh, drones uh, and also high altitude platform stations and also multiple layers of uh, satellites including low earth orbit medium earth orbit or geosynchronous earth orbit satellites now if you look at each of these layers, they come with their uh, particular advantages and disadvantages. Uh, the space network, uh, uh, first of all, come uh, it is it will already be there because we already have uh, started seeing the satellite uh, constellations. It has favorable link budget with uh, in comparison to uh, geo uh, satellites, and. Um, it has uh, it provides some coverage advantages due to uh, large footprints. Uh, however, it uh, they come with their own particular challenges that includes the high mobility uh, management uh, restrictions and latency problems. When we look at the aerial network, um, there are specific components associated with these. Uh, one of them is the high altitude platform stations. Uh, that uh, th those are uh, envisioned as devices uh, located in the stratosphere uh, with an altitude around 20 kilometers from the surface of the Earth, and uh, uh, UAVs uh, that are uh, those are flying uh, at a few hundred meters. They can serve as a mobile terminal or a, a base station. And this network also comes with its own advantages, uh, with uh, flexible deployment, uh, relatively cost-effective services, uh, low round-trip delays. However, the high mobility and the associated coverage requirements will constitute a, a problem uh, for these uh, deployments. So how can we make it a commercial success as the standardization um, 
uh, emerges as the main solution. And if you look at the standardization aspects, it's already emerging. So that's good news from that front. Uh, even starting from the uh, release 15 of the uh, third generation partnership project, we can see the uh, inclusion of uh, bo both uh, unmanned aerial systems, high altitude platform stations, and also the satellites of multiple layers uh, to be included, especially in the new radio um, standardization aspects. And also, uh, we must note that 3GPP is not the only organization that considers its standardization, and, that, and there are a number of activities going on. Um, and um, it's clear that uh, uh, with the standardization, uh, it is possible to increase the total number of uh, users in these systems, and it's possible to make the satellite systems a commercial success. Now, if we look at the um, uh, co communication aspects, the, the technical aspects, um, I would like to focus on the space ground connectivity first, and then uh, move on to inter-satellite communications. Uh, there are, uh, from the space to ground connectivity, there are two uh, different technologies. The first one is the RF communications, and RF com communications comes with its own advantages that include a negligible effect of the weather for propagation conditions as available in both line of sight and non-line of sight regions. Uh, RF can be used with uh, various different applications. However, uh, it comes with the challenges, first of all, starting with licensing, spectrum congestion, the uh, possibility of low data rates, and sometimes the security risks. Now, if you look at the pre-space optical communications, which is which can be perceived as a competitive technology, uh, it also comes with the advantages of high data rates and it's license free. However, under uh, uh, different atmospheric and weather conditions, the performance can change dramatically. Uh, so far in our research, we, we try to look at a combination of both both these words and try to un uh, understand the performances of hybrid communication systems with uh, that supports RF and FSO, and uh, the results seem actually rather promising. Um, depending on the protocol design, it is possible to get the best of uh, both worlds. Now, if you look at the interspace communication, the intra-satellite intra communications, um, one uh, essential uh, component uh, emerges as the cooperation, uh, use of multiple nodes, either the satellites or high altitude platform stations, uh, that can increase the performance significantly. And another uh, question that I would like to raise is the use of higher frequency bands, including the terahertz. Uh, and this uh, has uh, its own perks, and that basically comes from its uh, radar sensing capabilities. So uh, terahertz would provide a, a, an excellent opportunity for to enable joint communication and sensing paradigm, and it can uh, serve as an excellent means uh, to um, benefit uh, from these accurate uh, sensing performance. Now, if you look at the networking aspect, once we connect all these components, um, uh, the the uh, the problem uh, from networking uh, side is rather different because now the networking elements are moving, and I would like to mention a few notes from uh, our, uh, what I learned with my uh, uh, work uh, with uh, Dr. Pablo Maduri uh, so far. First of all, I learned that this is a rather difficult problem uh, to address, and uh, as a uh, promising solution, the delay tolerant networking strategy um, uh, also uh, uh, emerges as a good good solution. Now, here uh, the idea is to uh, uh, <coughs> Uh, so the the the, the uh, idea that we are trying to exp uh, understand is how we can exploit the pred predictable nature of the orbital propagation conditions, and uh, once we have this kind of knowledge, uh, clearly um, we can use it to optimize uh, routing and data forwarding uh, perspective. So, uh, although the the problem is difficult, the predictability alleviates the difficulty of the problem. Now, just before I conclude, I would like to give a couple of uh, uh, directions for resource directions that include um, 
why, why actually why why the networking problem especially is uh, more difficult uh we need to worry about the mobility management uh and uh in addition to that we need to also focus on fault tolerance uh tolerance solutions because uh, now we are looking at the uh satellites it's not easy to uh make interventions and uh, dynamic spectrum management and intelligent management and orchestration uh comes as uh next uh research directions and of course the objective is to have the full integration of satellite networks and terrestrial uh 6g networks and we are envisioning that this will actually uh move towards uh deeper deeper networks so this is a uh it network structure will become more um sophisticated um so if you ever want to work on communication uh research or networking research it's a it's an excellent time to be involved uh so to conclude uh, uh the uh, next generation communication systems uh, including 6g will uh, aim to have no one behind and uh, there will be new networking elements and new frequency bands and interactions where uh, via various types of sub networks need to be defined and uh, although the problem is um, uh, difficult, uh, the solution is, uh, the, the, the promise is ubiquitous connectivity. Uh, so it's worth the, uh, worth all, all this work. Uh, so I would like to thank you for your attention and I acknowledge my uh, dear collaborators in this slide. And if you have any questions, I can uh, either answer them right now, um, because I'm hoping to be online uh, after after this uh, presentation, or you can always send me an email, uh, gunesh.kurt at polyempia.ca. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gunes. Since um, some questions were already answered in the chat and time is also tight, let's um, move on to Sandra Cespedes. You, you can still please feel free to ask any questions to Gunes in the, in the chat or per email. So Sandra is an assistant professor with the Department of Computer Science and Software Engineering at the Concordia University. And today she will talk about net network size estimation in direct-to-satellite IoT. Thank you, Sandra. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, perfectly. Yes. Okay, good, thank you. Okay, so uh, this uh, is a follow-up uh, presentation because last year, uh, Pablo Lavaca, which is a student working on this subject, he did a first uh, review of the topic uh, in the paper, uh, student paper section. And we continue working on this subject. So I would like to just give you an update of what we're doing right now and what are the latest results. So this is a joint, uh, research which is done with uh, Samuel Montejo from UTEM in Chile, Juan Freire from INRIA, Richard Demo Sousa from Brazil, and this is me, Sandra Cespedes from Concordia University. And okay, so why do we want to do network size estimation? So we are thinking about the, this direct to satellite architecture, which was, uh, was presented also in, in previous uh, ex expert talks, in which we have uh, sensor nodes connecting directly to the uh, sa uh, satellite. And in this case, we're thinking about very low cost uh, nano satellites or CubeSats mostly. And uh, so that means we have restricted resources in, uh, in the infrastructure side, as well as in the uh, uh, <clears throat> sensor network side. So, in these uh, scenarios, we have a shared uplink channel, and we, of course, need to coordinate the transmissions because the footprint is quite large or could be quite large. And that means we need to have an efficient use of uh, the resources. And what the nanosatellite is, is, uh, is perceiving from, from the, from, from the uh, grounds uh, network is that there is a variable and possibly high number of nodes under the footprint. So many of the uh, network protocols, either if it's access protocols or routing protocols, they will have an impact depending on how many nodes on earth are, want, are, are uh, intending to transfer or transport information towards the satellite. So thinking about that, uh, we said, okay, we need to deal with constrained resources at the nanosatellite. We also have a shared uplink and then the resources are limited because in this example, we are using, for example, a MAC protocol that uses 
uh, uh, time division uh, approach in which we have frames that are slotted in time, and then the number of, uh, of uh, users or nodes could be high. So if we know the network size, at least if we have a good estimation of the network size, then we could say, give that information to Mac protocol so that they can adapt, let's say that's the size of the frame, or they can adapt the, uh, the chances that, that they give to nodes on Earth to access the, the channel, or they can delay those accesses and, and so on. We can also define better uplink transmission policies that could work in, um, in a joint manner with the MAC protocol. And here I'm giving just two examples of recent papers that actually uh, assume that they know or that they have an estimation of the network size so that they can have a better design in terms of the MAC protocol or the uplink transmission policies. And potentially this could also be uh, uh, of use for higher layer protocols, let's say a routing or transport layers at some point that, that could also make a good use of this information. And even for operational aspects, such as expanding the size of the constellation, if we have this uh, network size information, then uh, we could check that the service capacity is getting to the maximum. So we could even launch new satellites to the constellation so that we can expand uh, the service uh, capacity. So what about previous estimation mechanisms? There are many, uh, but they were focusing on uh, terrestrial networks and many of them were focusing on wireless sensor networks. So basically they assume that connectivity is persistent, that they, there are no energy constraints for, for mostly for uh, the gateways or the base stations that they were usually always connected to some uh, source of power. They many times assume that there is ad hoc connectivity among the sensor nodes so that they can detect each other. And then they, based on that, they build the, the information needed for estimates, estimating the number of nodes. And uh, many of them also assume that the gateways are static or they are base stations that they don't move. So none of these assumptions uh, um, work for our DTS IoT scenario, which we have gateways that are moving. We have a variable number of uh, nodes here. Uh, the nodes, they don't have a connection to each other because they are only, uh, they only have a, a wireless connection to, toward the satellite, not to the other nodes. And of course, they don't have a persistent connection, especially if we have a sparse constellation. So in that case, they don't have this, uh, this persistent connection. So we said, okay, let's take a look at what uh, has been done before and let's try to build on, on top of what is, is still useful for our scenario. And so we decided to propose a new estimation mechanism, which is in part based on one um, which was proposed by Zanella. I'm sorry that I didn't put, I forgot to put the, the the citation here, but it was proposed by Zanella uh, a while ago, like 2012. It was for uh, RFID uh, sensor networks. And so we decided to use what was um, useful from that proposal and make the proper adaptations and also to contribute with new ways to estimate the network size. So we have two phases, the estimation phase and the operational phase. The estimation phase is the one where we actually do the estimations and it's using a beacon-based communication, such as the one that I showed in the previous slide here. So we have frames in which the satellite is announcing itself using a beacon. And then there's a, a period in which nodes can start transmission. So instead of transmitting useful data, we have a set of rounds in which uh, nodes are basically sending transmission, dummy transmissions, just for them to be detected by the satellite. So basically in that, uh, in that time, all nodes under coverage will attempt a transmission and upon reception of the satellite, we can have, of course, a successful reception. Sometimes, some other times we may have a slots that are in collision. So many nodes may collide two or more and then idle slots as well. So in the case that they, the signals are very weak, so the satellite doesn't detect any useful reception, it, it assumes the uh, a slot was empty or if no node attempted a transmission because they select a, a slot uh, using ra a random uh, distribution. So what we need for this to work is that at this point at least is that uh, the satellite is going over the same locations every time. And for that, of course, we will need a design in which we are using an Earth repeat orbit uh, uh, deployment. So that 
ensures that we will see the same set of nodes uh, in a second pass or a third pass. Uh, I will discuss about that uh, restriction by the end of the talk. And then we, of course, if we have multiple passes or more iterations, we may, we may uh, improve the estimations that we're doing. So we started with a naive estimation in which we are using this formula that you see here in the point one of, uh, of our algorithm in which we are basically counting the number of successful transmissions and the number, the number of collided slots. Here we are assuming it's only two nodes colliding, which is not true. Of course, we know that there might be more, but we started with that naive uh, uh, estimation. And then we see that the orange curve is showing that we get to, um, uh, have some estimation that is close to the real number. The real number is the red curve. Uh, but at some point it just saturates because the, the frame length will limit the estimation. So if we increase the frame length, length, which is the blue curve, we have a better estimation, but still is saturating with the size of the, of the frame. And so we decided to go with uh, for a, a, a correction function. So basically we will have an offline uh, simulation in which we increase the frame length so that the frame length so that we have a better uh, estimation of the number of nodes and then we calculate the coefficients that we need for uh, the correction when the satellite is collecting the um, the this uh, fee function here so basically we collect we uh, calculate those coefficients that this could be done in a ground station and then we will upload that to the satellite so that it has the correction function uh, available uh, by the time that is starting with the estimation phase. So it, it already has that, that uh, correction function. So with that, we have a low cost uh, estimation uh, mechanism that is not uh, uh, costly in terms of computing time or in terms of uh, memory storage. So what we did was to compare our mechanism with, the, with two others that were available in the literature and that were able to be adapted to this scenario. One of them is, is ZAN as I, uh, from Zanella and the other one is SMMSE. And what we are seeing here is that uh, when we have different detection rates, that means that when part of the transmissions are lost due to uh, to a channel that is that is uh, is noisy and that that specific uh, transmission was uh, didn't have enough uh, power uh, the receiver side then we, you see that uh, the estimation mechanisms for the other two uh, schemes uh, when the, the detection rate goes uh, lower say 95 percent or 75 percent the error will go higher instead in our mechanism we we, we maintain a low uh, error in, in this case. This is comparing, of course, with the real number of nodes that we want to estimate. This is assuming we have an oracle and we know uh, how many number, how many nodes are uh, deployed. We also compare uh, the, the um, uh, window size that we need and we, we detected that for SMMSE is very costly in terms of the resources that we need, the frame length. Instead for Zanella and for us, it, we keep it very low. So we are able to keep a frame length that is quite uh, small. And finally, for the computing time, we also saw that uh, we, we couldn't implement the SMMSC in the hardware that we tried at the beginning, but this was a RAS, uh, RASB zero, which is similar to what we have in, uh, in, in nanosatellites. And we could uh, detect that the computation time for our scheme was quite, was uh, at least, 40% uh, lower than for the ZAN scheme that we were using as a benchmark. Now, why do we want to have this? To help a MAC protocol or another protocol. So we tried this in a frame slotted Aloha game protocol, which was proposed for, for actually for satellite networks uh, just uh, three years ago. And this is similar to you know, slotted Aloha. We know that the maximum theoretical throughput that we can get is below 40%. And what we see here is that in terms of throughput, all the schemes are quite close. The blue one is ours. So you can see that there's a gain there that we get uh, a better estimation. Uh, and that means that we uh, help the protocol to have a, a slightly better throughput than the other two schemes. But also in terms of efficiency, 
we see that uh, uh, our scheme is higher in terms of, uh, I mean, the protocol achieves a better efficiency when it receives the help from our scheme rather than the other two estimation schemes. So to close this, uh, what is next for us? We want to test this, uh, this um, estimation scheme using a realistic simulator. For that, there is one that has been uh, developed by INRIA, that's, that's Florasat, and there's, we also have a student that is working on that on that um, uh, tool, which is Diego Maldonado. We want to run some sensitivity analysis. We want to see what is the impact if we don't get to have non-repeating orbits. So we, we see if we can still do a good estimation, even if, uh, if the orbit is not um, repeating over the same locations. We want to check uh, what uh, uh, information we could exploit if we have uh, if we consider a constellation instead of a single satellite collecting the information and then try that with different other MAC protocols or, or transmission policies to see how the estimation may help these protocols to improve the performance. We want to check if we need to make still improvements in the design considering the results from these uh, tests. And hopefully in the future, we want to test this in a, in a CubeSat payload in a partnership with uh, SPEL, which is the Space and Planet Exploration Laboratory from the University of Chile, which are a collaborator of us. And so that, that brings me to the end. Thanks for your attention. And these are the projects that were supporting our research. Thank you so much, Sandra, and congratulations um, to your very impressive results. <laughs> <laughs> um, are there any um, questions for Sandra? Um, um, this might be a chance to, to ask her. Um, if not, um, please feel free to send her um, your questions by your mail. And um, thank you everyone for your, for your patience and for attending this um, session together with us. And uh, it was uh, really exciting to hear about the progress at various places. And um, I'd like to remind you that um, another session will start in roughly in, in an hour and uh, 20 minutes. Um, which will be chaired by Scott Burley. And um, yeah, Juan, do you have any final words? No, thank you everyone for staying. Sorry for skipping a few minutes beyond the agenda uh, time. So um, I say again, thank you guys for the speaker. Excellent talks today. Um, sorry for technical issues. And I hope to see you in, in, in another STEAM session later on. Thank you everyone for joining. Thank you everyone. Bye bye. Bye.